former Republican chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, Congressman Mike Rogers, also former FBI Assistant Director Tom Fuentes. Uh, Mike's got a past in the FBI as well. You know a thing or two about this. So, so help us digest this new information. In addition to the, you know, the buying of the guns, the ammunition, all this kind of stuff, now we know he put his wife on a life insurance policy, bought her a big ring, transferred ownership of the house for 10 bucks, all these kinds of things. F from your perspective, are these the kinds of signs that people close to him, Mike, should have seen coupled with what they've said about his past sort of jihadist tendencies, anger, et cetera? Well, given the information that the FBI went out to his uh, to the mosque and, and interviewed people at the mosque about his associations, and this information that as far back as April he began making these financial decisions, uh, that tells me that it is highly likely that someone around him, somebody in his pattern of life, knew more than they have told uh, law enforcement and police at least up to this day. And we know at a minimum they're looking at his wife right now, right now for possible charges. T Tom, in your experience, and this is a big priority in counter-terror efforts now, it's trying to, to get communities as close as family members to, to, to give warnings. I mean, what in your experience keeps people back from sharing that kind of informa information? To be fair, it's not clear-cut. I mean, you may see something, worry about something and not know for sure, but, but is it fear? Is it loyalty? Well, what holds them back? Well, I think part of it's denial, that mm. family members, parents, spouses just don't think it can't be true. He can't be planning this kind of an event. But in a case like this, also, you have a woman that was abused by him. Yeah. So her fear would be, the, let's say, the night of the attack. There's some indication that he was texting her and vice versa to verify that it was him, that he was doing this attack. Well, if she didn't know that positively, then... She's not going to call the FBI or the police and say, I think my husband's going to go out and do something bad, unless she knew positively he was. Because if, if they go grab him and he's at a friend's house, he's going to come home and beat her. Yeah. And so she's going to have that legitimate fear of retaliation from him or, or if their, she's inaccurate. Or their child, their young boy. Well, imagine the man in charge of keeping you safe in your home, your neighborhood, even your local courthouse, turning out to be a mass murderer. That is the shocking revelation for some Florida residents who lived and worked alongside the terror terrorist until the very day of that Orlando massacre. CNN correspondent Brian Todd has been digging further on the killer's background. So, Brian, were there signs of violence uh, and disturbing behavior when Mateen worked as a security guard and, and, and even before that? Jim, there don't appear to be any, have been any signs when he was working here, but residents here are outraged that this man was just working feet away from their doors and in charge of guarding them. We're right outside PGA Village. We are not allowed to go inside. That is one of the guardhouses back here where Omar Mateen worked. You can see the gates going up. It's a very secure place, but, you know, when Omar Mateen was here, uh, people here had really no clue about his background. Uh, our photojournalist Eddie Gross is going to kind of take you in there where he where he worked there as a security guard. There are three guard houses here. We're told that he rotated between those three guard houses. Um, there was a contentious community meeting here two nights ago. We're told when residents here were grilling one of the G4S uh, officials. That's the company that hired Omar Mateen. Really a contentious meeting. They were firing questions at this man, and some of them feel apparently like he stonewalled them and wasn't giving them proper answers. Some of them asked him, when is the contract up? We're told that a lot of residents here are very upset. They want G4S out as their security firm. Um, you know, it's, it's it, what we're told is that Mateen actually came to work on Saturday, that he finished his shift here, right at, at these guardhouses, in mid-afternoon. That was just hours before he went on that murderous rampage. I spoke to Larry Lee. He is a state representative, but he's also a resident here at the PGA Village. He lives, he says, uh, just a, a short distance away from a guardhouse that Mateen guarded. Take a listen to what Larry Lee said. Many of them are very afraid, and, uh, but I think not just in our development, I think that this is a wake-up call to uh, anyone in America. You know, just because a guy um, is a security guard, you don't know if such uh, incidents happen at a prior location that our homeowners association should know about it. I asked Larry Lee if the Homeowners Association here had been informed by G4S about Omar Mateen's past issues. Larry Lee said he couldn't say. We called the security company G4S. No word back from them on whether they informed the Homeowners Association. When we called the Homeowners Association here to ask those questions, we were hung up on. Jim? So I know you've been also looking back even as far as his childhood. Were there warning signs about violence then as well? 
Jim, there were dozens of warning signs. We've been digging into documents uh, going all the way back to at least third grade in the school systems of St. Lucie County and in Martin County. Today, we were told, uh, we actually uh, combed through some records from the Martin County schools saying that Omar Mateen had been suspended for a total of 48 days when he was in high school. And in two of those instances, uh, that the suspensions involved fighting and injury. We also combed through his records from elementary school, and we found 31 instances of discipline toward him between 1992 and 1999. Uh, there were just several incidents of him being disruptive in class. At one point, a classmate told us in fifth grade, he threatened to bring a gun to school and kill everyone. Jim? So many layers to his motivation. Brian Todd, thanks very much. So now that Speaker Paul Ryan has endorsed Donald Trump, he's telling Republicans to follow his example, right? Nope. Ryan says his fellow Republicans should follow their conscience. And now there is a new movement among delegates to ditch the convention rules and free delegates to do exactly that, vote their conscience. CNN senior Washington correspondent Jeff Zeleny is here with me. So, so Jeff, how serious is this new push by delegates, and could it succeed in replacing him at the convention? Jim, I think you can file this under wishful thinking here. I mean, Republican worries about Trump have only grown, but the chances for success are still minimal at the convention. All of these, all of these discussions are coming as the politics of guns in the wake of the Orlando shooting still dominate the campaign conversation. And I'm going to save your Second Amendment, folks. I'm going to save you a second. Donald Trump in search of a lifeline, trying to rally Republicans behind his full-throated support of the Second Amendment. But tonight, not all Republicans are rallying around Trump. The Second Amendment didn't kill anybody. Florida Governor Rick Scott, a Trump ally, telling CNN's Pamela Brown the Orlando shooting calls for a different conversation. The Second Amendment's been around for over 200 years. It didn't... It didn't you know, that's not what killed innocent people. Let's have a conversation about how we destroy ISIS. The Orlando massacre is thrusting the gun debate to the front of the political agenda. A new Gallup poll finds 79% of Republicans say the nightclub shooting was an act of Islamic terrorism, while 60% of Democrats interpret it as domestic gun violence. With Republicans increasingly divided over his candidacy, Trump hopes guns will galvanize his support inside the GOP and beyond. And Hillary wants to abolish the Second Amendment. Remember that. Hillary Clinton is pushing for new and stronger gun laws, but far from abolishing the Second Amendment. These are demonstrably lies. But he feels compelled to tell them because he has to distract us from the fact he has nothing substantive to say. But what he is saying is riling up Republicans. On NBC's Meet the Press, House As Speaker Paul agree, Ryan offering a permission slip for Republicans to vote their conscience for or against Trump. The last thing I would do is tell anybody to do something that's contrary to their conscience. Of course I wouldn't do that. Ryan's not rescinding his endorsement, but that doesn't mean he likes what Trump is doing to the party. Yet the chasm among Republicans is widening. Several top Republicans are looking beyond Trump in hopes of salvaging the party's Senate majority. Thank you all. Former President George W. Bush, who has said he will not support Trump, is campaigning for vulnerable Republican Senate candidates across the country. But some Republicans are focusing on Trump, exploring last-ditch efforts to block his nomination at next month's convention in Cleveland. CNN has learned a plan is underway to push some delegates to break their allegiance to Trump. One organizer is New Jersey Republican and former Cruz supporter Steve Lonigan, who told CNN... These delegates have a moral obligation to nominate a candidate who best represents the values of the Republican Party. Right now, Donald Trump is taking the party into a catastrophic loss. Now, as for these efforts to try and change the convention rules, Donald Trump released a statement a short time ago saying this. People that I defeated soundly in the primaries will do anything to get a second shot, but there is no mechanism for it to happen. Jim? Defeated soundly in the primaries. Jeff Zeleny, thanks very much.